In his satirical fantasy Gulliver's Travels, published in 1726, Jonathan Swift refers to Mars as having two moons. Nothing wrong with that, except they wouldn't be discovered for another 150 years. Astronomers on the flying island of Lapusha, says Gulliver, had discovered two lesser stars or satellites which revolve around Mars, whereof the innermost is distant from the center of the primary exactly three of his diameters and the outermost five. The former revolves in the space of ten hours and the latter in twenty-one and a half. When the two Martian moons Phobos and Deimos were eventually found, their orbits proved to be quite similar to those described in Swift's novel. Phobos is actually 6,000 kilometers from the surface of Mars and revolves around Mars in 7.7 .7 hours, whereas Swift gave the values as 13,600 kilometers and 10 hours. Deimos averages 20,100 kilometers from Mars and orbits in 30.3 hours. Swift's values are 27,200 kilometers and 21.5 hours. There's been some wild speculation about how Swift could have known in advance about the Martian moons, including the theory that Swift himself was a Martian. In fact, the idea that Mars might have two satellites goes back to Johann Kepler and a memoir he published in 1610, in which he misconstrued an anagram devised by Galileo in order to announce secretly a new discovery. What Galileo had actually found were features connected with the planet Saturn, which we now know to be its rings. He devised an anagram, the correct solution of which when translated from the Latin was, I have observed the most distant planet to have a triple form. However, Kepler solved the anagram incorrectly so that it translated as Hail, Twin Companionship, Children of Mars so he assumed that Galileo had discovered two Martian moons. Although the true meaning of the anagram became known half a century later, Kepler's mistranslation endured and it seems came down to Swift, who may have added some logic of his own. Since no Martian moons had been found in the early 18th century, it would have been reasonable to assume that they must be very small, very close to the planet, or both. Whatever the case, Swift's fictional moons turned out to be surprisingly like their real counterparts. In 1877, Phobos and Deimos were discovered by Asaph Hall using a telescope at the US Naval Observatory. Working at the same site, Bevan Sharpless concluded in 1944, after analyzing measurements made since Hall's discovery, that the orbit of Phobos was decaying. The little moon was spiraling down on a collision course with Mars. For a number of years, this result remained a minor curiosity. Then in 1959, Soviet astrophysicist Josef Shlovsky took up the challenge to explain why the orbit of Phobos was shrinking. He looked at the possibility that the thin upper regions of the Martian atmosphere might be gradually slowing Phobos down, but decided this effect would be too small to account for the results Sharpless had obtained. Among the alternatives he considered were the influence of the Sun, a tidal interaction with the gravity of Mars, and the effect of a hypothetical Martian magnetic field. However, none of these seemed to provide a satisfactory mechanism, so Shlovsky went back to the idea that atmospheric drag might somehow be involved, and came up with an audacious suggestion. What, he asked, if Phobos were not an ordinary moon? What if its average density were only a thousandth that of water, so that the thin outer atmosphere of Mars could act as an effective break and destabilize the little moon's orbit? What in fact, if Phobos were hollow? A hollow object 22 kilometers across couldn't possibly be natural. It would have to be the product of a technology well in advance of our own, surpassing even that required to build the great network of waterways and pumping stations envisaged by Percival Lowell. In the book Intelligent Life in the Universe, co-authored with Carl Sagan, Shlovsky wrote, Since Mars does not have a large natural satellite such as our moon, the construction of artificial satellites would be of relatively greater importance to an advanced Martian civilization in its expansion into space. 
the launching of massive satellites from Mars would be a somewhat easier task than from Earth because of the lower Martian gravity. Shlovsky thought it unlikely that the creators of Phobos were still alive. Perhaps Phobos, he wrote, was launched into orbit in the heyday of a technical civilization on Mars some hundreds of millions of years ago. But the idea of a still thriving Martian civilization didn't faze some others, including Frank Salisbury, professor of plant physiology at Colorado State University. He pointed out that neither of the Martian moons had been spotted in 1862, when Mars was closer than in Hall's discovery year of 1877, and when large instruments were trained upon it. Should we attribute, he said, the failure of 1862 to imperfections in the existing telescopes? Or may we imagine that the satellites were launched into orbit between 1862 and 1877? Sadly, close-up images of Phobos captured by the Viking orbiters and more recent probes have revealed a more prosaic truth. There's nothing suggestive of artifice about this rocky, pockmarked, potato-shaped moon. Like Deimos, it looks like an asteroid. So, it's been suggested, both moons had been asteroids that wandered too close to the red planet and were captured by Mars' gravitational field. But captured objects would be expected to follow much more elliptical and randomly inclined orbits around the planet. Instead, the orbits of the Martian moons are almost circular and lie in the equatorial plane of Mars. So what else could explain the current orbits of Phobos and Deimos? Researchers in Switzerland and the United States have recently carried out computer simulations to trace the orbits and their changes back into the past. It seems the orbits of Phobos and Deimos may have crossed in the past, suggesting the moons had a common point of origin. The researchers have concluded that a larger moon was orbiting Mars back then, and this original moon was probably hit by another body, causing it to disintegrate. Phobos and Deimos are fragments of this lost moon. Their calculations show that the common ancestor of Phobos and Deimos was further away from Mars than Phobos is today. While Deimos has remained in the vicinity of where it came into being, the larger Phobos is being pulled in closer and closer to Mars. Measurements made in 1988 confirmed that the orbit of Phobos is unstable, however its rate of decay is only about half that claimed by Sharpless so that it can be accounted for in terms of tidal forces acting on a natural solid body. Each year the little moon draws an inch or so closer to its parent planet. Phobos never came from the surface of Mars, but it will end up there sometime within the next 40 million years, either in pieces having been ripped apart by tidal forces as its orbit continues to decay, or, if it survives intact, blasting a crater some 500 kilometers across.